Welcome back with a smiling face. Links to previous episodes are given in the video description, so don't forget to like, subscribe and share the video. The Orphan Secrets Episode 13, Last Episode Chapter 74 Saren's POV God, Saren. Why won't you just admit that you love me? Kale Thornwood screamed in my face. How many times are we going to play this game, Kale Thornwood? I don't love you. I have never loved you. I never will love you. Stop wasting both of our time and just kill me already. I shouted at him, knowing full well that he didn't have the balls to do so. No. No, no, no. Killing you won't accomplish anything. Killing you will kill me because that's how mate bonds work, he rambled on. I clicked my tongue and rolled my eyes. Kale Thornwood has definitely gotten off the bus somewhere between Looneyville and Delusional City. Ever since Callie and I exposed ourselves to Kale Thornwood with the whole speaking at the same time trick, he's been even more hellbent on getting me to admit to something he knows wouldn't even be true. He thinks that my special abilities are supposed to be shared with him because he was my first mate, no matter how many times I tell him that Jasper was my first mate. Thankfully, neither he nor Morgan knows what I am. Otherwise, they would have tried to kill me by now. Kale Thornwood, I think it's time we put your plan into motion, don't you? Morgan suggested to him. I looked over at her and furrowed my brows. Because I was still in this damn cage, and the spell she was using to prevent me from reading their minds was still in place, I couldn't get a sense of what they were up to. Hearing that they had a plan was making me a little nervous. It's too bad the Beta isn't here to see this, Morgan added. Where is Kendrick? What did you do with him? I demanded. Kendrick had been taken out of the cell the other day and was placed somewhere else. He had gotten caught mind-linking with Melody, and that's when they figured out that the potion only prevented me from reading minds, but not mates from mind-linking each other. They moved him far away from Melody and, that was the problem I was currently facing I was alone with Kale Thornwood and this stupid witch. Callie insisted that she could break through it, but I didn't want to let them know we could. I was afraid they would notice and that we would lose the element of surprise. Do it, Kale Thornwood said to her without answering my question about Kendrick. Do what? I asked, a little freaked out. Morgan chanted something in a language I had never heard before, and then I noticed that the barrier around the cell was gone. I could immediately hear Kale Thornwood's thoughts. It doesn't matter if you can read my mind. Riles. Everything will be better in no time at all. You're insane. I screamed. Do you honestly think that swapping my memories will get you what you want? I know that it will. As soon as you take this potion, and Morgan here says her spell, you will remember me as the love of your life. And Jasper? Well, you'll remember him as the man who tormented you all of those years. Don't forget, Kale Thornwood, you're not the only one who tortured me. Your entire family, that entire pack did. Do you honestly think that you could wipe my memories of hundreds of people hurting me? Those are going to be erased. Permanently, he smirked. If Svetlana couldn't completely sever with my bond with Jasper, then what makes you think this sorry excuse of a witch can? Why you little? Morgan slapped me hard across the face. I turned my cheek because I felt my L.P. bust. Thankfully, it healed in no time, and I was pretty sure that Kale Thornwood and Morgan didn't notice. I slowly turned my face back to look them in the eye. Was that supposed to hurt? I mocked her. She aimed to hit me again, but Kale Thornwood stopped her. Morgan, enough. Just get the petition. She handed it over to him, and he passed it to me. 
I just sat there, staring at it. Take the potion, Saren. No. Take it. No. Saren. Take the potion before I shove it down your throat. I'd like to see you try. His eyes fell kale thornwood black, and he grabbed the back of my head by the root of my hair and pulled it as hard as he could, forcing my head to tilt back and to scream in pain. As soon as my mouth opened, he poured the liquid down my throat. I did my best not to swallow it, but when the vial became empty, Kale Thornwood forced my mouth closed and blew into my nose. That somehow forced me to swallow the god-awful tasting potion. As soon as the last drop went down, Morgan started to chant again. Callie, what do we do? Don't panic, Saren. We're going to be okay. Kale Thornwood and this witch can't change our memories. How do you know that? I don't want to forget Jasper. I can't even imagine not ever knowing him. Saren, stay calm. We will get through this. Just wait and see. As soon as Morgan stopped chanting, I felt pressure in my head. Almost as if Callie were trying to push through and take over. I realized that's exactly what she was doing. Callie pushed to the surface but didn't make it known to Kale Thornwood or Morgan. For a minute, I was a passenger in my own mind. I saw everything from Callie's perspective in my own body. We had never really switched like this without both of us being in the forefront of my brain. A few seconds later, Callie gave me back control. That's when I noticed that none of my memories were altered. I looked at Kale Thornwood and Morgan and was about to tell them that their efforts were for nothing, but Callie stopped me. Saren, pretend that it worked. That's the only way we can keep our secret, for the time being, maintain the element of surprise, and also be let out of here. What did you do? I switched our minds just as she finished the spell. Their goal was to change your memories, not mine. So, taking over completely prevented the spell from running its course through your mind, and since it didn't target me, it didn't do anything. Isn't she going to know it didn't work? No. Morgan is a weak witch, as I've said before. She won't know the difference. She assumes, and that's where we will gain the upper hand. You're a genius. I know. I smirked to myself as she settled into the back of my mind. I looked at Kale Thornwood and Morgan again and then immediately got ready to put on the show of a lifetime. I just hoped that I could pull this off without making any mistakes. Saren. Kale Thornwood. I looked around the cell. W.H. Why am I chained? Why am I in a cage? I started to fake a panic. You don't remember, he asked me and I'd Morgan. Remember what? Unchain her, he shouted at Morgan. She waved her hand, and the chains came undone. Perfect, I thought to myself. Kale Thornwood, why would you chain me up like that? I faked some tears. I'm sorry, baby. I had to. You were saying some incoherent things and then you attacked Morgan, he lied straight out of his teeth. Morgan. I looked over at her and studied her as if I had never met her before. I'm so sorry, Luna, but Kale Thornwood asked that I subdue you for your safety and the safety of others, she answered with the fakest voice of sincerity I had ever heard. Oh, I couldn't wait to wipe that smile right off her ugly face. Come on, love. Let's get out of the dungeon now that you're all better, Kale Thornwood said and led me away. I felt him put his hand on the small of my back, and I immediately got the chills. I knew that he believed that I felt the mate bond with him now, so I had to pretend that it was Jasper touching me so that I could fake being aroused. As soon as I did, I could hear Kale Thornwood inhale deeply. Saren now's not the time for that he whispered in my ear seductively. 
I wanted to vomit everywhere but kept it down. I turned to face him and put on the fakest smile I could ever fake. Kale Thornwood, baby, where are we? I asked him sweetly. It was impossible to miss the light that fell, aired in his eyes when I called him baby. I don't think I had ever met someone so gullible and susceptible to manipulation. This was going to be glorious. I have a surprise for you, he told me and kept leading me out of the dungeon, as he put it. When he opened the door, and I looked around, it was then I realized where I was. Callie, do you? I see it. We're back at Blood Moon. We're in the pack house. But how? It was destroyed. I don't think that this is real, Saren. I get the feeling this must be a magical mirage or something along those lines. A mirage? Do you mean something that one sees but isn't actually there? Yes, but something is off. What do you mean? I don't know, but whatever you do, do not let your guard down. I won't. Are you okay? Kale Thornwood asked. Hum? Oh, yeah, fine. Just a little dizzy, that's all. I'm sorry, baby. After I show you the surprise, you can go lay down in our bed. I nodded my head. He took my hand and interlocked our fingers. I felt repulsed by him touching me, but I had to keep my feelings in check. This was going to be more complicated than I wanted, especially if he kept insisting on touching me. What's the surprise? I asked. If I told you, it wouldn't be a surprise now, would it? He answered and smiled. I wanted to smack that smile right off of his face. I shook my head and kept going along with everything. He led me to the main foyer of the pack house and, that's where I saw everyone. They were gagged and chained with silver along the walls. I was completely mortified by what I was seeing. Men, women, and children were chained. Kale Thornwood, what is this? I asked him, unable to hide my shock. Your surprise, baby. I found the pack responsible for attacking Silver Lake, he said. I snapped my head towards him. Was he serious right now? Saren, don't listen to him. He's completely catatonic. Melody shouted. A guard hit her in the stomach, and Kendrick snarled from the opposite side of her. It finally made sense as to why he took multiple pack members from every pack in the region. I didn't have to read his mind to know what this was all about. He wanted to pass off this group of hostages as a pack of its own to take the blame away from Kellen and Blood Moon. Did he think that I was really going to be that stupid? I wish I could just rip his off right this second. Kale Thornwood, I don't understand. How can a pack like this kill my parents and my pack? There aren't very many of them and I don't sense an alpha in the room. Other than you, of course, baby, I added in quickly. I didn't miss how the Blue Lake pack members' mouths hit the floor the moment I said that to Kale Thornwood. Well, my love, you don't sense an alpha because there isn't one. Wrong. Kendrick is an alpha by blood, and so is Melody. Dumba.ss Also, these people aren't actually here, he said. I looked at him with wide eyes. Morgan came up next to him and snapped her fingers. Everyone disappeared. What? I ran over to where everyone just was. Hologram, darling. They were all holograms, he said to me. I snapped my head towards him and saw that stupid smirk on his face. Why only holograms? Why not just bring them here so I can face them myself? Well, as much as I would love to give you what you want, Saren, my father is still calling the shots. What? But what about your alpha ceremony? I asked. 
I saw his eyes gauge me questionably for a second. I quickly read his thoughts. How does she still remember the Alpha Ceremony? That should have been erased along with all of the other memories of that night except for us finding out we're mates. I mean, we did have one, right? I remember sending out the invitations. You don't remember, he asked me carefully. Morgan must have inged up. No harm in telling her that it was ruined by Jasper. She won't know the difference anyway. Remember what? I asked back. I had to be careful. Think Saren, think. If my memories were swapped or erased, then I would have to play as if that night happened in reverse. I mean, I remember being yelled at by this alpha right after the toast, and then you came to my rescue. I saw his face visibly relax. Perfect. Right. You were being ambushed by an alpha and his beta. It was the beta that snarled a little bit ago. Beta Kendrick, if I recall. I tried to play into the conversation. Yes. But it wasn't my ceremony, it was the other alphas, he replied, he really did want everything to be switched. Do you remember the alpha? Jasper, I think. He was such a D, C, K. Well, baby, that's because he tried to take you from me. And he tortured you for so long. Oh, yeah. Being a slave at his pack really s. Ucked, I agreed. Kale Thornwood's face started to relax. I went to this ceremony, and when we found out we were mates, he tried to tell me that you were his first, I looked over at him and huffed. Is he high on drugs? How could I be his mate if I'm your mate? Even I were his mate, I would have rejected him. His smile got even bigger, and I knew that he really started to believe my memories were altered. Callie, I don't know if I can keep up this charade much longer. He wants to have Ix. I can sense his arousal. We will have to make excuses not to. We can't let him be intimate with us. It would hurt Jasper and Blade. I know that. Saren. Hum. Are you okay? Yeah, just arguing with my wolf. She's being silly. What did she say? Just that she wants to go out and run around. She said she feels like it's been like forever since I've let her out. I saw the panic in his eyes before he shook it off. That was weird. Um, maybe tomorrow, baby. You said that you were tired. Maybe we should go to sleep? Or, maybe we can, you know, he suggested while softly caressing my arm. Goosebumps of terror immediately flared up. Hmm, I see that your body wants me, he said and smirked. Kale Thornwood, babe, I am a bit tired. Maybe we can do that tomorrow night. I tried to play it off. I saw the FL Kale Thornwood of suspicion and quickly faked a yawn. I mean, you did have me in the dungeon a little while ago. Right, right. Yeah, sorry. You're right. You're tired. We can make love later. I smiled and turned my heel to walk away. Wait for me. I'll go with you. No, it's okay. I just want to take a bath and lie down. You go do what you need to do. I mean, I'm sure you and your dad have a lot to discuss when it comes to, that pack, I replied. Kale Thornwood didn't even hesitate to smile and nodded his head. He leaned in to kiss me but I turned my cheek slightly, so he barely missed my L, P.S. I knew that that small kiss alone would be felt by Jasper. I just hoped that he didn't think the worst. I smiled and walked up the stairs. As I made it to Kale Thornwood's floor, I saw the guest room that Jasper had stayed in back then. I looked behind me and saw no one around. I opened the door to the guest room and was shocked to see it completely empty. Not even empty, 
just, dark. It wasn't a room at all. It was a black hole. What? I stepped back and closed the door. I went across the hall and opened the door to Kale Thornwood's room but found that one to be completely normal. Even the in-suite bathroom was the same. What the? I went back out into the hall and opened all of the other bedrooms to find that they were black holes too. What is going on? I went back to Kale Thornwood's room but remembered there was access to the attic on this floor. I went down the hall and found the string that was attached to the attic door. I pulled on it, and the ladder fell. I caught it before it hit the floor, and I ran up it as fast as I could. I peeked my head up into the opening and saw that the attic looked to be normal. I climbed all the way up and gently crawled over to the vent that led to the back of the pack house. It looked the same as it used to. Even the screws were still loose. I pulled them out, placed them in the corner by the wood, and pushed one side of the vent open. I jumped out and landed on my feet. The moment I did, that's when I noticed that something was terribly wrong. I looked up and fell back down on me. Oh, my, God, I stuttered in fear. I found myself next to a teacup the size of Blue Lake Castle right next to me. I looked around and saw that everything looked like a scene out of the movie Alice in Wonderland. Callie, what spot? I think I know what's happening. Care to enlighten me? Saren, turn around. I did as she said, and what I saw behind me made the blood in my face rush to the solace of my feet. Callie, is that what I think it is? It is. It's the Blood Moon Pack House. No, Callie. That's a dollhouse. I've been shrunk and put into a dollhouse? Svetlana's POV. Svetlana. I looked at Jasper, who seemed as if he was going to bite my head off. Thank goodness for Richard, who was keeping me shielded. J. The Jade Wolf's mate looked to her for answers as well. She just shrugged her shoulders and appeared to be as lost as I was. Are you both saying that there is nothing here? The Gamma of Blue Lake shouted at us. I looked at the Jade Wolf, and she at me. We both shook our heads. Svetlana, there's no dark magic here at all. Zandra asked me. I shook my head. I was stunned and at a loss for words. If Morgan had cast an illusion spell on the area, I would have sensed it. And yet, there was nothing here. None whatsoever. Where Spot is my mate? Chapter 75 Jasper's POV After the way things have played out recently, coming to Blood Moon to try and find Saren first, only to be met with absolutely nothing, felt like someone rubbing salt into the wound. I was starting to lose all hope and about to go ballistic. My patience had all but disappeared already, and I was beginning to regret not letting Saren kill everyone a few months ago. Had I just allowed her to, then none of this would be happening. It was no longer a secret that I made everything too personal when it came to Saren and her powers. I was starting to understand why every time we went one step forward, we ended up going ten steps back. Now here we were, standing in an empty field, for no reason whatsoever than to figure our next course of action. Jasper, I think we should head over to Silver Lake and save the hostages, Griffin suggested. We're not going anywhere until we figure out where Spot Saren is. I fired back. But Jasper, she's not here. I'm sorry, we were wrong, but she's alive at the very least. You would know if she weren't, Zandra said with remorse. You being wrong is the understatement of the century, Zandra. I snapped at her. Griffin immediately got in my face and snarled at me. I snarled right back. I was not in the mood for measuring DS, and I sure as hell was not in the mood to deal with incompetence. Okay, you two, that is enough. 
Richard said and pushed us apart. We don't have time for petty arguments between the two of you. Griffin, I get that you're feeling protective of Xandra, but you need to put yourself in Jasper's shoes. And Jasper, you need to get a hold of yourself and your anger. Snapping at everyone is not going to help us proceed any faster. I was about to respond when I noticed Jason staring off into space. Jason, what spot are you doing? I asked him. He didn't look at me but moved his head to the side instead. Jace. I called out to him. Without saying anything, he signaled with his hand for me to go over, so I did. When I stood next to him, I looked at his face and saw him furrowing his brows and staring out. I followed his line of sight and saw what he saw. What is that? If I'm not mistaken, that looks like smoke coming from a chimney, he replied. I sensed Griffin and Richard as they came up next to us. Hmm, I don't recall any civilization being in that area, Richard commented. I glanced at Griffin and he at me. Worth a shot, he asked. I nodded my head. Jace, stay here and keep an eye out. Griffin, Richard, Svetlana, Jay, and I will go check it out. Sure thing, Jasper. Jace turned around and ordered everyone to fan out and stay hidden just in case. Griffin gave the same order to Brent and made sure that Xandra and Alexa stayed behind for now. The rest of us linked up with Svetlana, and she transported us about 100 yards away from where we saw the smoke. Sure enough, I could see a dim light through the trees. Morgan, was all I heard. I turned to Svetlana and saw her L, P twitching. That's her shack. We're not that far away from where Blood Moon used to be. Why wouldn't you sense it? I asked her because. There was no magic in that area, and believe it or not, there's no dark magic coming from the shack. Then how do you know it's Morgan's? Griffin asked. Because I can see her. We all snapped our heads towards the cabin and saw someone in the window. Is that her? I asked, and Svetlana nodded her head. She's, young, Richard commented. That's because she is, and she's stupid. She thinks that hiding out in the middle of nowhere would keep her safe. That's why there's no magic protecting the shack. And it appears that she's not alone. I looked up again and saw Morgan standing next to someone that looked to be in a trance. Kale Thornwood. What happened to him? Griffin asked. I never met the guy but I don't think he's supposed to look like that. He's under a spell, and he is dying, Svetlana replied. I gaped at her in shock. What do you mean he's dying? I repeated. He sold his soul to Morgan. That's why she's helping him. I told you, Jasper, dark witches always have a price. You told me that she was helping them because Kellen saved her life. No, I said she was helping Kellen because he saved her life. I never said that she was helping Kale Thornwood for that same price. Dark witches are conniving, and they always see Kale Thornwood in their fares. For Kellen, it was him saving her life. For Kale Thornwood, it was his soul. It appears that whatever spells and potions she's been using to keep Saren hidden is taking a toll on Kale Thornwood. Are you saying that there's no reason to kill him? Griffin asked. Oh no, Jasper should still kill him, or if we can find Saren, then she should kill him, however, that won't kill Morgan. But, if someone kills Morgan, which I'm hoping that it's me, Kale Thornwood goes with her. Just like Layla would have if you were actually killed by Alessandro, I stated, and she nodded her head. He did exactly what Layla did. He sold his soul to Morgan so she would help him get Saren. That seems to be the case, Svetlana answered. I can sense her. We all looked at Jay, 
whose eyes had suddenly started to glow, but very dimly. I can sense, Saren. She's in that shack. Are you positive? Yes, but her signal, it's weak. Do you think she's injured? I asked. Wait, that wouldn't make sense. Saren heals five times faster than a normal wolf. No, it's not as if she's weakened or injured. It almost feels, small. Jay said and looked at me with a confused expression. I mean, Saren is on the pet, T.E. side, but I don't think that would entail her powers being small, I replied, just as baffled as she was. That's because she is small, Svetlana interjected. Come again. I know what Morgan is up to. That sniveling little weasel. How had I not guessed it before? Ugh. She is using one of the oldest spells in the Book of Dark Craft. So old, in fact, that experienced dark witches don't even use it anymore. What is it? Griffin asked. Shrinking. What? We all replied in unison. Saren is using her powers, but they feel small because she herself is actually small. Morgan has shrunk her. Which means she's keeping her in a dollhouse. Probably with Kale Thornwood. What? Everyone repeated again. Are you telling me that my mate and my unborn pup have been shrunk? Like she's some kind of Polly Pocket. Basically. This, I'm going in there right now and killing these. I got to my feet and was about to storm over there when Svetlana restrained me with her powers. Killing her does not reverse the spell. Killing her will solidify it. We have to let Saren know that we are here first. How? Have you tried to mind link her? We turned around to see Zandra behind us. Zandra? What are you doing here? I asked you to stay behind with Brent and the others, Griffin chastised her. I was worried about Saren. I couldn't help it, she replied. If you aren't Saren's sister, I said to her and shook my head. She just smiled. No, Zandra, I haven't tried to link her. But, I might as well do that now since you've mentioned it. Dearest? Can you hear me? Saren? Jasper? I heard a faint voice. It was so faint I almost thought I imagined it. Jasper? I heard it again. Saren, I can barely hear you. I, Runk, all h use. What? I, Runk, in, all house. You're shrunken in a dollhouse? Why, s. Don't worry, Svetlana figured that out. We're about a hundred yards away from the shack that you are being held in. Saren, Kale Thornwood sold his soul to Morgan. Oh, Sen, Uphid, Bit. Your size is making your link come in weak. Uck, is, ucks. Saren, are you in the dollhouse right now? Oh. What? No, O.T. out, itting B, O. You got out and are hiding behind a teacup? Yes. Kale Thornwood, Eed, Itch Memo, A.Q., Ad Guy. Kale Thornwood tried to switch your memories and make me the bad guy? Yet. Yeah. Okay. Just hang tight. We're coming to get you. And this time... I won't stop you from killing him. But first, we need to reverse the shrinking spell on you. Her. Kale Thornwood, Il Noti. I'm, on. Hurry before Kale Thornwood notices that you're gone. Wait, are you saying that he is in the dollhouse with you? How is that possible? His body is with Morgan in the shack. On Tino. Just me, of, air. We'll get you out of there. I broke the link with Saren and looked around at everyone. I could see they were expecting some good news. 
I was able to link her, I told them, and they all smiled and silently high-fived. The connection is weak, and she just confirmed that she has, indeed, been shrunk and put into a dollhouse. She says that she got out and is hiding behind a teacup. She also said that Kale Thornwood was in the dollhouse with her and that we have to hurry before he realizes that she escaped. How is that possible? Richard asked. His soul is in the dollhouse while his body sleeps in full size, Svetlana answered. What else did she say? Zandra asked. When I told her that Kale Thornwood sold his soul, she said that he tried to switch her memories and make me out to be the bad guy. An alteration of the spell that I used on you, Svetlana stated. It doesn't appear to have worked, though. Of course, it wouldn't. Saren is a primordial. Dark magic used directly on her has no effect, especially like that one. Her wolf can switch their subconscious just as the spell is cast, and it would counteract it. That is why the primordial cannot fall victim to spells and potions. I had to admit, I liked hearing that. Okay, now that we know my sister is in there, what are we going to do? Zandra asked. I didn't respond but instead linked with Jason and had him bring everyone to our location. It would only take about 20 minutes, given that's how long we were here before Zandra showed up out of the blue. After everyone arrived, I sent Svetlana and Jay first so that Svetlana could check for magical traps and for Jay to concentrate on Saren. It appeared that Saren was trying to use her powers for something, but because of her current size, it wasn't packing the punch that it needed. Once Svetlana gave us the all clear, we all went in towards the shack, surrounding it completely. When we got close enough to the door, I was about to shift and break it down, but then it swung open. Did you really think that I didn't know you were outside? Morgan challenged me. All I want is my mate. Hand her over to me, and we can go our separate ways. MMMM. No. Morgana. She snapped her head to her left, and there stood a waving Svetlana. Svetlana? You're working with them. Of course. Why wouldn't I? What do you owe them? Nothing. It is a choice I made a few years ago. To side with the strongest werewolf to ever exist, Svetlana bragged. It is not a good choice to be on the bad side of a primordial. What? Him? He's not a primordial. Morgan said, pointing at me. I see D.A. Brow and then looked back at Svetlana, who doubled over in laughter. What's so funny? Morgan screeched. I glanced over at Jay, who seemed to be looking around for something on the ground. When she finally stopped and bent over, I saw her pick something up. She had the biggest smile on her face, and she was staring at whatever was in the palm of her hand. She came and stood next to Svetlana with her hand held out in front of her. Svetlana stopped laughing and composed herself when she saw whatever it was that Jay was holding. Morgana, did I say I was talking about him? No. I mean her, Svetlana replied. As soon as she finished her sentence, she snapped her fingers, and Saren appeared full size right next to Jay. No. Oh yes, Saren said and pushed Morgan into the wall of the house with so much force that she went straight through it. Morgan C. R. Kale Thornwood landed, and we heard something shatter. That's when we heard Kale Thornwood scream in rage. No. But how, he cried. We switched your memories. How could this happen? He came running out of the shack while holding onto the frame of the door. He was staring daggers at me, and then his eyes snapped towards Saren, who was walking over to me. I guess there's no use in lying anymore, Kale Thornwood, she smirked. You already know that I can run faster than any wolf, that my wolf is of a unique color, 
and that we can somehow speak at the same time. But what you don't know is that I have many, many more skills and powers that one couldn't even be able to comprehend. I'm not just a werewolf, Kale Thornwood. No, I'm what's called a primordial. A what? pri.more.d.al She's the most powerful werewolf to ever exist, Kale Thornwood. And she's all mine, I told him and H. Ugged her from behind before K, sing her mark. I felt her body shudder with arousal and saw Kale Thornwood's body tremble with anger. Morgan. Kale Thornwood screamed, but there was no response. Oh, sorry, but Morgan is going to be out for a minute, Saren taunted. Don't count on it, little girl. Morgan walked up behind Kale Thornwood while huffing and puffing. Wake the others. Kale Thornwood commanded. Morgan started to chant something. Stop her. I shouted at Svetlana, but before she could, it was too late. Howls were sounding off all around us. Everyone on your toes. Richard cautioned us. Half of the group shifted into their wolves and got into formation. Saren will be mine. I will kill you if it's the last thing I do, he directed at me. Not if I kill you first. Saren shot back. No she looked at me in shock and anger. Saren, Kale Thornwood is mine. But. Kale Thornwood is my rival, not yours. Then let me kill the witch at least. Sorry, Saren, but she is mine, Svetlana said, clicking her teeth. What? Saren, save your energy. Because when we're done here, you're going to need it to fight Kellen. Her eyes widened at my words. I just nodded my head and gently put her behind me as Blade was getting ready to take over. You want her? Then try and take her. Kale Thornwood shifted into his wolf, and I shifted into Blade as we charged at each other. We collided in our wolf forms and started to claw at each other while trying to avoid getting bitten by the other. Svetlana was right, Kale Thornwood had been weakened by the dark magic Morgan was using on him. I wondered if he knew about it, but then again, I didn't really care. Kano tried to bite down on Blade's neck but Blade maneuvered out of the way just in time and struck Kano across the face with his paw, cutting his eye and knocking him down. Blade took the opportunity to pounce on him and bite down, but Kano was able to avoid Blade biting into his jugular by just a hair. Kano spun in a circle, and the inertia of the spin made Blade lose his grip, and he flew off. He tumbled a few times, and when he got up, Kano landed on his back and bit down on his shoulder. Blade was bigger than Kano, not just in size but in muscles as well, so even though Kano bit down with intensity, he really only got a few layers of fur and skin. Enough to wound, but not kill. Blade stood on his back paws and landed with such force onto his paws, fl, ping Kano over his head and making him land onto his back and hard. Kano whimpered and struggled to get up. When he did roll over and stood up, Blade was already in front of him and used his hind legs to kick him backward. That's when the eruption of snarls, growls, and howls sounded, and droves of wolves emerged from the trees. I couldn't tell if we evenly matched or outnumbered, but at this point, I didn't care because we had something that they didn't. We had Saren. Dearest? Yet? I promise to never hold you back again. I know what you are capable of, and it scared me. I let fear and jealousy get the best of me and my judgment, and I hindered you from garnering your full potential. Jasper? Did you just say you were jealous? Yes, I was. I'm sorry I never admitted it or played it off as me being overprotective. But I promise to never stand in your way ever again. I know you know what you're doing. And from this moment forward, I trust that you will make the right decision when it comes to using your powers. Oh, 
Jasper. I'm sorry I made you feel that you couldn't be honest with me. No, don't be sorry. It was my own fault. It's like my mom said, it's a guy thing. It's the 21st century, and I should know better than to be misogynistic during this day and age. A man's pride shouldn't be about his individual strength but the strength he's given when he has the right woman by his side. I know now that we're stronger together, regardless of who is stronger individually. But I also accept that it's you, and I will forever support you and your powers, Saren. Jasper. Do your worst, baby. Show them who's boss. With those final words, Saren's eyes glowed silver, and she immediately turned and uprooted all of the trees around us, creating a massive barrier that kept out all of the rogue wolves. What? Morgan exclaimed in complete dismay. Kano got to his feet and looked around, shocked as well. Everyone could hear the rogues trying to break through the trees, but they were too tightly compressed together, making it almost impossible. I could have attacked Kano while he was distracted, but that would have been move, and I was anything but. Blade snarled at him getting his attention, and it was easy to see the anger radiating in waves off him. He was even more jealous, seeing exactly what he was missing out on. We charged at each other again. This time when we collided, Blade was able to get a hold of his leg with his jaw and swung him around while clamping down as hard as he could. I could hear Kano's cries of anguish, and I could taste the iron of his blood in my mouth. Blade let go, and he went flying into the trunk of a tree. Blade stalked over to him to finish him, but just as he was about to stomp down on his throat, there was a sharp pain that hit us both. Blade looked over his shoulder, and there I saw a silver blade sticking out. How ironic! Blade spun around to see Morgan in a position where she just had thrown it at us, and she was smirking. I could feel Blade's anger, but it was really intense. Almost as if it wasn't his. Blade? Is that you that I'm feeling? No. If it's not you, then who is it? Mate. What? Mate is very angry. I looked over to where Saren was, and when I saw what I was feeling, only two words came to mind. Oh. Chapter 76 Saren's POV To say things were strange would be the understatement of the century. Not only was I shrunk and put into a dollhouse, but I realized that Kendrick had been shrunk with me at one point. I was so curious to know how he had been able to mind link with Melody while we were this small, but that was something I would have to question later. While hiding behind the Jinner Mouse teacup, I heard a voice and a cackling, and it made sense that it would have been Morgan. That psychotic and her twisted magic. I mean, who the hell shrinks another person and puts them into a dollhouse? Talk about control issues. Being this small actually made me feel like a real-life Tinkerbell. The only difference was that I didn't have any wings. I had no idea who Morgan was talking to because I never heard anyone actually responding to her, but I knew that she wasn't alone. I figured that I could try and climb down the table, but I noticed that the leg of the table was a lot further away than I realized. If I moved from this hiding space, I would surely be seen. But if I stayed here any longer, then Kale Thornwood or whoever was in the dollhouse with me would notice that I was gone. I wondered if I could use my power to control the wind to guide me down to the floor, so I gave it a shot. There was a slight breeze coming from the cracked window, so I tried to get some leverage using the air around me, but it wasn't enough. It would only lift me up a few inches before settling. I tried a few more times, but it was no use. Since manipulating air didn't work, I thought maybe it would work if I used water to create a slide of some sort. I climbed up the handle of the teacup, only to be disappointed and find that it was completely empty, aside from a few droplets of tea or coffee. 
it wouldn't be enough to create a water slide. I slid back down the handle and hit again. I was quickly running out of options and was about to take my chances with Kale Thornwood in the dollhouse when I felt pressure in my head. I realized that I was being mind-linked by Jasper. I never thought I would be so happy to hear his voice. Of course, this proved to be more difficult than it should have been due to my tiny size. Jasper telling me that he was just outside of the shack gave me hope this would soon be over, but our connection was terrible because, well, my connection to him was the size of an inchworm. Thankfully, he understood. Enough of what I said. I was even more shocked to find out that Kale Thornwood had sold his soul to Morgan. Honestly, I wasn't that shocked since it sounds like something he would do, but I just didn't think he would actually go through with it. As I was trying to figure out another way to get down from the table, I heard Morgan open the door to the shack, and a gust of wind came in. This was my chance. The gust of wind had enough momentum to allow me to glide down with the current around the table. I won't lie, about halfway down, the intensity died, and I ended up landing on me. Unfortunately, I didn't have the time or luxury to dwell on the pain. The door to the shack was wide open, and I could hear Kale Thornwood calling for me from within the dollhouse. I stood up and ran as fast as I could towards the door while Jasper and Svetlana had Morgan distracted. Despite using my super speed, it still took me a good minute or so to get from the dining room to the front door. It was actually quite frustrating being this small. My powers didn't pack the punch that they usually did. Once I made it to the door frame, I looked up to make sure that Morgan hadn't noticed me or sensed me. I quickly jumped from the doorway down onto the stone that paved the way to my freedom. I had to use my super speed to get the running start I needed to reach the next stone, and that's when I realized Jay was looking down towards the ground. Jay! I screamed, which I'm sure sounded like a mouse in her ears. I waved my arms as hard as I could in hopes that she would see me. Jay! I'm down here! I called out to her. She kept looking around, but she was looking past me. I must look like an ant to her. Even with enhanced vision, it would be hard for anyone to spot me. I jumped to the next stone, which wasn't too far from her foot, and I picked up a pebble with my telekinetic powers. I aimed and flung it at her ankle, which she must have felt because she looked down at me again. This time, Jay saw me. She bent down and laid her hand flat on the stone right next to me, and I climbed on. I had to admit, this was pretty embarrassing and cool at the same time. She walked over to Svetlana, and when Svetlana saw me out of the corner of her eye, I waved, and she smirked. I knew that she would be able to return me back to normal, and I was ready to kill this B** age for turning me into an even smaller version of Thumbelina. When I was back to my usual size, I made a mental note to thank Svetlana with whatever she wanted, but first, there was hell to pay. Seeing Morgan's face react to my being full size again was glorious, and her finally realizing who I was even better. Using my telekinesis, I hurled Morgan through the house and into the dining room, where she landed on top of the dollhouse, shattering it to itty bitty pieces. That's when I heard Kale Thornwood scream my name. When he came wobbling over to the door, in a complete daze and barely able to hold himself upright, that was the moment I realized he was in worse shape than I originally thought. Whatever Morgan had been doing to him was slowly killing him, and I don't think he was even aware of it. There was no time to wonder about it though, I was ready to be rid of Kale Thornwood Patterson for good this time. I walked over to Jasper to show Kale Thornwood that he could never have me and to show him what it really felt like to be aroused by the touch of my mate. When Jasper kissed my mark, Callie purred with delight, and my body just gave in without a fight. It was a little unnerving to see just how much Jasper's touch affected my body, especially in a situation like the one we were in. 
Jasper making a point to kill Kale Thornwood himself kind of rubbed me the wrong way, but I would have settled for Morgan. After all, that B asterisk H turned me into a bite size version, but of course, Svetlana wanted to take Morgan on. Dark Witch against Poser. The fight with Jasper and Kale Thornwood should have been a clean fight, but it appeared that even though Kale Thornwood and possibly Kano were weakened by whatever St. Morgan had done to them, they were still skilled enough in defense to fend for themselves against Blade. Hearing the backup that Kale Thornwood summoned was what caught all of us off guard. Then Jasper told me the truth about how he had been feeling. That was an eye opener, to say the least. But, when he gave me full support to use my powers, I felt my body just come alive. I had never felt so much power radiate through my body. This fight was between the alphas. So, I uprooted every tree and created an unbreakable barrier around us, keeping the rogues that were on Kale Thornwood's side out. When the fight continued, and I noticed that Jasper was going in for the kill, I saw what happened next in slow motion. Morgan had conjured what appeared to be a dark athame and threw it at Jasper. The trajectory showed it going for his head, but luckily, he had gotten up onto his hind legs to stomp on Kano, so it hit him in the shoulder. That's when I saw nothing but red. The rage that coursed through my veins at that very moment was making my blood boil beyond one's imagination. Callie had pushed her way through and took over, forcing me to shift. I don't think I had shifted that fast ever. Nor had I ever run so fast. In a matter of mere seconds, I was fully shifted, and Callie was in Morgan's face, slicing at her C.Hest with her paw and catapulting her across the field. Before she could even land, though, Callie had made her way to the other side and back kicked Morgan in another direction. Callie did this several times. Morgan had become Callie's personal hacky sack. Finally, after dribbling her like a ball, Callie grabbed hold of her leg with her teeth and tossed her in the direction where Kano was still lying down. Callie sauntered towards them, her jaws open in a snarl, eyes glowing pure silver from my vision, and saliva just drooling from her mouth as if she were a rabid dog. I had never felt so much anger from my own wolf as I currently was. Attacking Jasper with an athame was the final straw for Callie. Morgan gathered her marbles and tried to cast another spell, but luckily, Svetlana beat her to it and sealed her mouth while tying her hands together with some kind of magical rope. Kano was starting to shift back into Kale Thornwood, and Jasper was receiving aid from Jay. I could see from the corner of Callie's eye that Jay was fixing his wound. Thankfully, there didn't appear to be any poison. Just a silver blade. Poison. That reminded me. I quickly shifted back because there was one more thing that I needed the answer to. Saren. Kale Thornwood croaked with blood spewing from his mouth. Jasper must have broken something when he kicked him into the tree. Why? Are you seriously asking me that? I screamed at him. Forget the fact that I was end ached from shifting, I was so livid at his blatant incompetence that nothing else mattered. Do you really not take into consideration how you and your family ruined my life? Are you that blind? Are you that stupid? Are you that egotistical? I told you I was sorry, he cried. That doesn't make what you did to me okay. I roared, shaking everything around us. You're only sorry because you found out she was an alpha at the time of the rejection, Jasper insisted as he walked up to us. He gave me a shirt, and I hastily put it on. I looked at his shoulder where the athame had penetrated, and all I saw was a small scar. I glanced over at Jay in surprise, and she just smiled. I mouthed thank you to her and turned back to Kale Thornwood. That's not true. Kale Thornwood said in a hushed tone. I've loved Saren since we were kids. I wanted to be her friend. But my father's views clouded my own, 
and it was all I knew growing up. Her being an alpha wasn't the only reason I regretted my decision to reject her. I regretted it before I had even done it. He wasn't lying. I remember he had told me all of this before, but it was before I had my powers. I know what my family and I did to you was wrong, in more ways than one, but I swear to you, Saren, I love you. MMMM. Morgan cried from behind her gag. I saw tears in her eyes as she stared daggers at Kale Thornwood. What the? I said out loud without realizing it. Svetlana, remove her gag. What? Why? she asked. Just do it. I commanded. Svetlana rolled her eyes and removed the magical gag from Morgan's mouth. What is it, Morgan? I asked, annoyed by her interruption. You. You told me you wanted her so you could keep her as a slave again, she screamed at Kale Thornwood. Did I miss something? Jasper asked. That's when I heard Kale Thornwood's thoughts. Oh my goddess, she's your second chance. I shouted at the top of my lungs. Everyone looked at them in shock and I mean everyone. No, she's not. She's just a witch that my father saved from a pack of rogues. We inged a few times. You told me you loved me. I told you what you wanted to hear so you would help me. Kale Thornwood exclaimed. Morgan sneered and hissed at him. If that was the case, then why did you sell your soul to her? Svetlana asked him. What? Kale Thornwood gaped at Svetlana in complete disbelief. I didn't. What are you? Sell my soul. I never thought that silence could be so loud. You, didn't know. I asked him. I could see the fury behind his eyes as he shifted back into Kano. Kano, don't. Jasper shouted. Kano stopped in his tracks with his jaws hovering over Morgan's head. I looked at Jasper in dismay. Why did you stop him? I demanded. Kano, if you kill her, you die too. Your soul is tied to hers. Killing her means you go with her. Jasper, what are you doing? I repeated with gritted teeth. Kale Thornwood, Kano, or whoever I'm talking to. Think before you do what you're about to do. You have a choice. We can either take both of you in, and you can be tried fairly by the council after we get a hold of your father. Or you kill her, and you die with her. The choice is yours, but those are your only choices. Jasper. I grabbed his arm, forcing him to face me. What dot are dot you dot doing? I growled at him. Saren, I'm doing the right thing. Kale Thornwood is going to die no matter what, but I think it's only fair that he is given a choice on how he goes. It was something that I've been thinking about since Svetlana told us Kale Thornwood sold his soul to Morgan and said that killing her means killing him. What does it matter how he dies? I shouted, not caring whether Kano heard me. Do you really feel that way about me? I turned back to see that Kale Thornwood was back in human form, and Svetlana gagged Morgan again. You know, I could stand here and reiterate all of the horrible and malicious things you and the Blood Moon Pack did to me for eight years, but I would just be wasting my breath. You know everything already, so there's no need to remind you of it. The fact of the matter is you just don't care. You don't care that you not only physically hurt me but also emotionally. You and your pack broke me to the point where I was ready to become a rogue for the rest of my life. I was going to give up everything just to get away from you. And then, the moon goddess decided to play some sick joke on me and make you my mate. Whether it was to punish you or with me, it didn't matter. Rejection is rejection and there was no way I was going to take you back, even if Jasper wasn't my true mate. I would have rather died than be mated to you. 
you only care about yourself. That's why you're in the predicament that you're in, Kale Thornwood. Your soul is literally being s.ucked out by the dark magic that Morgan has been using on you while we were in the dollhouse, but you were so caught up in the moment when you thought you had me that you didn't even notice. So, to answer your question, yes, that is how I think of you. And no, I will never regret it. So, how you die really doesn't matter to me, as long as you're dead. With that, I turned my heel to walk away, but before I could, I heard Morgan's muffled screams. I turned around to see that Kale Thornwood had dug his hands into her C.Hest. His eyes were full of tears as he ripped out her heart. He stared straight at me as I saw the light from his eyes disappear and he fell to the ground, completely lifeless. That was rather anticlimactic, Griffin said. No, it wasn't, Jasper answered. Selene was right, I was going to have to make a choice on who died and who lived. What? I looked over at him. Selene came to me, and she lectured me about a few things. Svetlana being one of them. Then she told me that there would come a time where I would have to decide who lived and who died. That's why I told Kale Thornwood what would happen if he killed Morgan. Killing Morgan would mean he died right away. Morgan would have more than likely been kept in captivity rather than be executed. Oh no, Jasper, that's not true. Morgan would have had to answer to the coven of dark witches. Just like you, my fine furry friends, dark witches have rules we have to follow. Using magic against another species for personal gain is one of them, Svetlana said. What do you mean? Richard asked as he came up and put his hands on her shoulders. I couldn't stop myself from lifting my brow in confusion at this sudden, intimate gesture. She took his soul without him knowing. If one sells their own of their own free will, that is one thing, but taking it is another. She would have more than likely been killed anyway. I looked over at Jasper, and he just furrowed his brows. I think Selene meant who you were going to kill, Jasper, I told him. That's not what she said, though. Since when has the moon goddess ever been up front with any of us? I asked him. He didn't have a response. Saren. I suddenly heard two very familiar voices. I turned around to see two heads of blonde hair coming at me. I caught both Zandra and Alexa, but we all tumbled to the ground and laughed as they landed on top of me. Um, I don't mean to disrupt this reunion, but we still have a couple of other issues to deal with, Richard reminded us. Richard's right. We have to deal with the rogues behind the trees, and then we have to go deal with Kellen, Jasper said as he and the others helped us up. Where is he? I asked without beating around the bush. He's at Silver Lake. Morgan created some kind of mirage that makes it seem like there's nothing but a gaping hole. Well, now that Morgan is dead, that spell should have reversed itself, Svetlana replied. You said that her death would only solidify her magic. Jasper shouted. No, I said that killing her would keep Saren small. That is a spell on her physical body, and it's one of the repercussions of killing the dark witch who cast it. A mirage spell is superficial. It breaks with the death of the witch who cast it. Dark magic is not black and white, Jasper. You should know that by now. Wait, what did you say? I asked when a sudden realization hit me. I said that the mirage spell. No, not that. The part where you said I would have stayed small if Morgan were to have been killed before it was reversed. I started to panic. Saren, what's wrong? Zandra asked. Kendrick. What about Ken? Jasper asked while pulling me to face him. He, he, he was in the dollhouse with me. What? Everyone cried out. He was there with me. But they moved him, 
and I have no idea where. I didn't have a chance to search their thoughts for that answer. I don't know where he is, Jasper. I mean, I saw a hologram of him and the others, but I don't know if he's actually there with them or not. I don't know where he is. Oh my goddess! What if he never left the dollhouse? I shouted as I ran back into the shack like a maniac. I went over to where the shattered dollhouse was and lifted all of the pieces into the air. I scattered them to see if I could find anything. Saren, I'm sure he's with the others, Jasper reassured me as he tried to calm my nerves. Jasper, try to link with him, Griffin suggested. If he's at Silver Lake, that's not far from here so we may be close enough. Jasper nodded, and I saw his eyes cloud over. I kept the pieces levitated as I waited for confirmation. It took a minute, but I started to see Jasper's facial expression change and become calm. His body relaxed, and his eyes turned back to their normal teal color. He's alive. I let out the breath that I was holding. But, I looked at him with white eyes. But what? Jasper didn't answer. Instead, he walked over to the kitchen and brought out a small birdcage. I dropped my arms, and everything fell to the floor. Jasper placed the cage down on the counter and opened it. Then about three dozen people walked out of the cage. My stars, Richard gasped. Kendrick's not the only one who's still small. I bent down onto my knees to get eye level with the counter and studied the small group of people, no pun intended. It was everyone that I had seen in the dollhouse hologram. Now I knew why Ken was able to mind link with Melody. She was in the shack just a few feet away from the dollhouse. Ken, is this everyone? I asked him. Yeah. Everyone that we know of. I watched as Jasper counted how many people there were. He's right. That seems to be everyone. There were just over 30 people taken from the region packs. There's 33 here, Jasper validated. Wait, Everett lied to us? He said that everyone was being held in cages at Silver Lake. How could he lie to us? Griffin exclaimed. We were at Silver Lake. Someone in the crowd shouted. Mom! Jason exclaimed. Hi, honey. What do you mean you were at Silver Lake, Aunt Zoe? Jasper asked her. We were there. But for some reason, we were all transported and ended up in that damn bird cage. We were full size at 1.2. Hold on, I don't get it. Why would Kellen have everyone sent here if he was going to hide in plain sight at Silver Lake? I asked. Guys. We all looked down to see Kendrick flailing his arms. We overheard Morgan on the phone earlier, and she said that the plan was in motion. They were hoping that all of the Alphas would follow Jasper to Silver Lake to try and save the hostages and then Kellen would be free to use the poison he used on Saren's dad on all of the Alphas. But they didn't come with us, at least, not yet, Jasper answered. Yeah, they're waiting for us to head to Silver Lake before joining us, Griffin added. Exactly. Morgan knew that you guys would be coming here first. She had sensors all over the Blood Moon territory. She told Kellen that his plan to catch you all at Silver Lake was a bust, so he left you guys to her and Kale Thornwood while he and Nicole go around from pack to pack to kill the Alphas and Lunas while their guards are down. We all snapped our heads towards Richard. Richard, we need to warn everybody. Jasper cried out. Richard and Svetlana didn't even hesitate to teleport out of there. Everyone in the cage. We will take you all back to Blue Lake until we can figure out a way to I was stopped mid-sentence when pressure started to fill the inside of my head. The images played at warp speed, but I saw them ever so clearly. As soon as they stopped, I couldn't stop myself from saying his name out loud. 
Ronan. I didn't even pause to think before I ran out of the shack. The trees were still surrounding us, and I knew the rogues were still waiting. I didn't have time to deal with them one by one. I need them out of my way and dead. The fireplace in the shack was still going. I used my power of fire manipulation and threw raging fireballs at all of the trees, making them explode. I knew that the shards of wood would impale the rogues behind them, either killing them or injuring them beyond repair. Their screams could be heard echoing into the skies. Once I cleared a path, I shifted and ran full speed back towards Blue Lake. I could hear Jasper calling out after me, but I didn't have the luxury of explaining to him what I had seen in my premonition. I had to make it there to stop Kellen. He already took one father from me, I was not about to let him take another. Chapter 77 Third Person POV At last, the moment had arrived when Saren was able to close the book on Kale Thornwood Patterson. But this was no cause for celebration, for a far greater threat still loomed in the distance. Kale Thornwood only had a small part to play in the grand scheme of Saren's misfortunes, and the one responsible for toying with the lives of so many people she cared for was about to make his move. The million-dollar question was whether her primordial prowess would be enough to put an end to this madness. Jasper and the others found themselves in familiar territory as they stared blankly off into space, trying to figure out why Saren had disappeared without warning. She sprinted off, full speed ahead, and they didn't realize what had happened until the dust settled. Before they knew what hit them, a thin veil of unease had overshadowed their short-lived victory. Hold on, did I miss something? Griffin asked. Did I hear her right? Did she say your dad's name before running out of the shack? Jason asked while turning to look at Jasper. It took a second for Jasper to register what just occurred, but upon the realization that his father may very well be in danger, Jasper wasted no time of his own shifting into Blade and taking off after Saren. Even though his speed was supernatural in wolf form, it was still no match for Saren's. He could only hope that his legs would carry him home in time to save his father from imminent danger. As the others felt a sense of deja vu while watching Jasper's retreating form, Griffin took point and ensured all of the hostages currently in a shrunken state were safe and sound within the birdcage. He handed off the cage to Zandra, and she clutched onto it while everyone else that remained shifted into their wolf forms. Havoc lowered his body to the ground, allowing Zandra to climb on. She held the cage firmly against her body while leaning forward slightly to hold onto Havoc's fur. As soon as she was settled, everyone immediately took off to head towards Blue Lake's territory. Meanwhile, Saren was running at full throttle and testing the limits of her super speed, just short of going Mach 1. Callie was maneuvering through trees and bushes, jumping over logs and boulders that would have otherwise been in her way with unmatched agility. The adrenaline pumping through her veins was the only thing preventing her from colliding with the inanimate objects obstructing her path. Callie burst through the edge of the woods and began the ascent of hills and mountains that would lead her back to Blue Lake. As she made her way to the top, she looked towards the sky and saw the crescent moon still hidden behind the blue hour clouds. That was the only indication she needed to know she was not too late, for, in Saren's premonition, she saw Ronan's death just as the moon revealed itself from behind the overcast of black and blue. The scene replayed once more in her mind a dagger in his sea. Hest and Kellen laughing over Ronan's dying body, whispering evil nothings about how he killed Ronan the same way he killed Gideon. Although neither Nicole nor Tessa were seen, she had no doubt that they were there as well. With Jasper pushing Blade to his max, they soon found themselves bursting through the forest's edge, only a few minutes behind Saren. Jasper was stunned at how fast Blade was running. Blade, when did you get so fast? I don't know. But I think I can go faster. Seriously? Let's find out. 
with a little push and the will to accelerate even more, faster was what they got. Blade's supernatural pace became even more extraordinary as he climbed the very same hills and mountains that Saren had just traversed not too long ago. This is crazy. Blade, what is going on? I think it's our mate. What do you mean? I think you finally accepting her fully and giving her free reign allows us to share her abilities. This isn't my speed. This is her speed. Riding in the back of his own mind, Jasper was speechless to hear this. He and Blade were sharing Saren and Callie's speed? If that was the case, then what else could they possibly be able to share as mates? That was something that they would have to test later. Right now, Jasper's number one concern was the safety of his family. Saren bolting the way she did after a premonition only meant that something terrible was going to happen, and it needed to be stopped right away. Jasper feared the worst, but he wouldn't go there until he absolutely needed to. Saren cleared the final hurdle and stood atop the mountain that overlooked the Blue Lake's signature lake. She was met with silence, however, that silence was fleeting as the alarm that signaled a challenge echoed through the night sky. She looked towards the castle and had a clear view of the front of it. That's when Saren saw the front doors burst open, and two wolves attacking each other emerged. She knew for sure that one was Harvey, Ronan's wolf, and the other was Dracul, Kellen's wolf. Or, as she liked to call him, Dracruel. Callie glanced up at the sky as she could sense the clouds were beginning to move and not in the direction they needed to. A sense of full-blown panic set in as she realized the moon was about to be fully exposed, which meant that she needed to move quickly. Saren pushed Callie to her top speed in no time at all as she barreled towards the fight. She could see that Dracul had overpowered Harvey and that he had also shifted back into Kellen. This was it, this was what she saw in her premonition. As she made her way onto the field in front of the castle, she leaped over the pack members that were outside bearing witness to the challenge, roaring with pure rage. Just as the syringe pierced the skin above Ronan's beating heart, Callie tackled Kellen, knocking the syringe out of his hand and onto the ground. Kellen rolled multiple times across the ground, snarling the entire time until he came to a halt. No, he screamed at his failed attempt to kill Ronan. He looked up from his place on the ground and saw the light blue wolf, realizing immediately that it was Saren. You. Callie snarled in response and stood between Kellen and Ronan while Grace and Dylan helped Ronan to his feet. You're supposed to be in a dollhouse. How are you here? Kellen cried. Out and was in complete disbelief that his plan to kill Ronan had been intercepted by someone who was nothing but a mere child in Kellen's eyes. Saren shifted back into her human form so that she could confront Kellen face to face. As soon as she did, someone wrapped her up in a blanket. She knew without even looking that it was Milan. But before confronting the man who ruined her entire childhood, Saren turned to Ronan. Are you okay? she asked him, her eyes softening with genuine concern. I'm fine. It barely pierced the skin. Nothing was injected, Ronan reassured her. Saren looked him over once more and saw that he was, indeed, 100% fine. If any poison had entered his bloodstream, he would have been keeled over and dying that very second. She turned her attention back to Kellen, who was seething. How? My planning was meticulous. Kellen shouted as he flailed his entire body, grabbed his hair, and screamed like a teenage girl. The next time you plan on attempting to kill everyone in the region, make sure that the most powerful wolf in existence isn't part of that region, someone else answered. Saren turned to see that Jasper had also made it back in time. What are you going on about? Most powerful wolf in existence. Before anyone could say another word, the sudden appearance of over a thousand werewolves caught everyone's attention. What? Kellen Patterson, 
a powerful voice boomed. Every single head that was attached to a body snapped in the direction of the voice, and there stood the twelve elders that made up the council of the region, with Jonah at the point, Richard at his right, and Svetlana his left. All the werewolves bowed their heads in respect. Jonah and Richard stepped aside opposite one another as an unknown individual was thrown onto the ground in front of the crowd. Jonah, who is that? Jasper asked. This here is the assistant M.E. of the council that helped Kellen and his family fake their deaths and escape. Jonah answered. Saren snarled at the puny man at the feet of the elders. He has already confessed to his crimes, but seeing how his decision greatly affected everyone here, we have decided to give you all the choice to determine his fate. Death, all of the Alphas present shouted as one monolithic voice. Alpha Jasper. Richard addressed him. He didn't answer, but instead, Jasper looked down at Saren and nodded his head. Saren didn't need to be told twice. Her eyes glowed bright silver, and her hair danced in the wind from her aura of immense power as she focused all of her energy on the betrayer. The crowd of onlookers gasped in astonishment and, most of all fear. Without lifting a single finger, Saren's powerful telekinetic powers shattered every bone in the assistant M.E.S. body. Saren gave him exactly what he deserved, a slow and agonizingly painful death. His screams could be heard for miles past the Blue Lake territory, which Griffin and the others heard as they, too, made their final descent into Blue Lake. Oh my god, what is that? Zandra asked out loud as the cries continued echoing. All of a sudden, the sounds of anguish completely stopped. Whoever it was, just died a very slow and painful death. Griffin said to her in a mind link. And something tells me that they deserved it. Xandra couldn't help but wonder if it had been Kellen whose cries were heard just now, but she ruled it out quickly since she knew that killing him would not be so easy. That and she knew to expect a second cry to be heard if it had been him. Nicole's cries at the loss of her mate. The palpable silence only confirmed that it wasn't Kellen that had died. What's wrong, Zandra? Alexa linked her. I was hoping that it was Kellen who just died. Oh. Does that make me a bad person? No. That makes you normal. Kellen's a bad man. And a horrible werewolf. He ruined so many lives and he deserves to die even more painfully than this other person did. I'm kind of glad it wasn't him, though. What? Why? Because. I want to be there to witness Saren kill him. Does that make me a bad person? No. But that does make you sound psychotic. Shut up. Xandra couldn't help but laugh a little over her jab at Alexa. It definitely eased her conscience and removed the guilt from her thoughts about wanting Kellen to just hurry up and die. But she and Alexa were in agreement on one thing she, too, wanted to bear witness to his death and the end of his terror. As they ran over the mountain that led into the territory, a massive roar that didn't belong to a werewolf could be heard reverberating through the skies. A blur of orange could be seen running parallel to them. What caught Zandra off guard was the fact that there was more than one blur of orange running with them. Riker. Zandra called out. A roar could be heard as a response, and Zandra couldn't help but smile, seeing that her friend had joined them. When the pack of wolves reached the base of the mountain, they were met by two were tigers, one being Riker and the other was someone they didn't recognize. Uh huh. Riker. Who is this? Zandra asked. Riker rubbed his face into the neck of the other tiger, and they both purred with delight. Zandra gasped as her smile reached ear to ear. Oh. 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 I want to hear all about this. Especially since you were supposed to stay back and keep the pack house safe. How in the world did you know to? Ah, never mind. We don't have time for this, 
she exclaimed, and they took off again to meet everyone at the castle where they bore witness to Kellen's ever-growing temper tantrum. What are you? Kellen screamed at Saren when he saw his alibi lifeless and looking like an overcooked noodle, his bones and his brain matter spilling out of his cranium. The most powerful wolf in existence. Either you don't know how to listen, or your old age has made go deaf, Saren spat at him. You? The most powerful wolf? That's not possible. You're nothing but a street rat. That you found in the rubble of my pack house after you destroyed it. You always assumed that I was an Omega, and then you found out I was an Alpha. But what you were never told was that not only am I an Alpha, I am also a primordial. I possess power beyond anyone's comprehension, and what you saw me do just now is nothing compared to what I'm going to do to you. Saren wailed and lifted Kellen into the sky as she closed his airways. She used her power of water manipulation and summoned a massive whirlpool from the lake, concealing Kellen within it and essentially drowning him. Let him go, someone screamed. Everyone's attention turned towards the voice, and there stood Nicole and Tessa with Grace in their grasp, the syringe that Kellen had dropped pointed at her jugular vein. Let him go or I will kill her. Nicole screamed again, pushing the tip of the needle even closer to Grace's neck. Saren knew that Nicole wasn't bluffing, so she did what Nicole wanted and released Kellen. But she never said she had to let him go nicely. Saren shut off her powers as if they were a light switch, and Kellen fell to the ground with the water SPL Kale Thornwooding on top of him. Kellen hacked up the water and coughed for dear life. Nicole. You ungrateful. After everything that we did for you, this is how you repay us. Did for me? You mean did to me? For you, to you, it doesn't matter. We gave you a home. We let you eat our food. We even gave you a purpose. You should be thanking us for not killing you. Tessa interjected. Saren glared at both of them, trying to find a way to get the needle away from Grace. Because of the close proximity and Nicole's thumb on the trigger, just waiting to push in the injector, Saren couldn't risk scaring Nicole because it would surely make her thumb slip. Don't even think about using your powers on me, you little hellion. I heard everything you said and saw everything you just did. If you even so much as lift a finger, I will plunge this poison straight into her neck. If you hurt my mother, I swear on the moon goddess that I will rip your head off. Jasper snarled. Like I told you before, Jasper, Tessa started to say as she stepped forward. You chose the wrong mate. You could have had so much more, but you chose that little W.E. Who cares if she has powers? All that comes with it is problems and enemies. Had you chosen me, or even Layla, your life would be so much easier. So much calmer. What have you gotten out of being mated to Saren? Hum? Your memory's taken from you. Rejection. Near death. And now, you have to deal with my family and me. I'm sure that my... Brother had his way with her a few times already. Are you sure you still want that piece of T.R. Kale Thornwood? Tessa blabbed on. Kale Thornwood didn't touch me. I didn't give him the chance. And he never will either, Saren said and stared at Nicole, who didn't miss the twinkle in Saren's eyes when she said that. What? What did you do to my son? If we're going to be technical, I didn't do anything except outsmart him. Morgan, on the other hand, did quite a bit to him. What are you talking about? Morgan, the dark witch that Kellen saved and has been helping you guys? She and Kale Thornwood had a little fling, and well, she took his soul as payment without his knowledge. She was slowly killing him. And in retaliation for her deceit, Kale Thornwood ripped out her heart killing her as well as himself. 
hearing that her son was now dead did nothing but escalate the situation at hand. Nicole screamed in agony at the death of her second-born and only son, distracting her long enough to allow Grace to push her away and free herself. Ah! Nicole screamed at the top of her lungs and ran after Grace. Ronan intercepted Nicole and tried to fight her off, which led to Tessa pursuing Grace. But Milan appeared and intercepted her, tackling her to the ground. Both shifted into their wolves and started to be dot raw. The chaos threw everyone off and gave Nicole an opening to knock Ronan away from her. She picked up the syringe and stood over Ronan. No. Saren and Jasper cried at the same time and tried to run to him, but before they could even get two feet, they stopped when they both saw that someone else had gotten in the way. Time had slowed to a near stop. Saren whimpered when she saw what happened. At the same time, Tessa's wolf could be heard crying and screaming in pure pain as Milan's wolf, Ivory, tore her to shreds. Tessa Nicole cried as her daughter was killed mercilessly. Saren was stunned at the turn of events, but Jasper was not. He ran past her and straight to his father, leaving her completely open to an attack. Kellen took the opportunity to shift and ran full speed to pounce on her, but Saren knew Kellen and his dirty style of fighting. She turned just in time and caught Dracul Midair with her powers of psychokinetic energy and crushed his larynx without even batting an aisle Kale Thornwood. Kellen slowly started to suffocate as she continued to put pressure on his windpipes. Before I kill you, I think it's time that Nicole knows exactly what you did. Saren shouted at him. She forced his wolf to retreat into the back of his mind and made him shift back into human form, never once letting him go. Knowing that Saren was referring to them, Zandra and Alexa both stepped forward. Nicole had been apprehended by Jasper and Jason and was on her knees facing three blondes that looked so much like the woman she hated more than anything. Nicole, I'd like you to meet my half-sisters, Zandra and Alexa. Why should I care about your sisters? Nicole spat. Because. They're not only my sisters, but Tessa's and Kale Thornwood's too. That information hit Nicole like a ton of bricks, and it didn't take her long to realize the meaning behind Saren's words. What? Your mate had my mother kidnapped. He put her in a cage. Like some kind of animal and then forced himself onto her and violated her until she conceived his pups. Kellen killed my father because he wanted my mother. He wanted her and the girls that she gave birth to. He wanted a family with her, even if it was going to be by force. But my mother didn't want that with him. Even if it meant giving up the daughters that she loved more than life itself. She gave all of us up because she wanted to protect us from this piece of sh, t you call a mate. Saren exclaimed and slammed Kellen to the ground in front of Nicole. You had X with Megan. Nicole screeched at Kellen, who was literally suffocating to death. She broke free from Jasper and Jason and started to beat him. She sl Kale Thornwood at him with her claws, stomped on him with her feet and slammed his head onto the ground. She reached into her back pocket and pulled out a second syringe. No. Saren shouted and forced the syringe out of her hand. Nicole seized the opportunity to run at Saren, colliding with her. Nicole had her hands around Saren's neck and squeezed as hard as he could, but what she didn't expect was for two wolves to attack her from behind. Those two wolves being Atlanta and Brooklyn. Without even hesitating, Xandra's and Alexa's wolves tore Nicole to shreds in order to protect Saren. Sisters saving their sister. Saren stood to her feet and found that Kellen was still breathing. Saren stood over him, and her L. P.S. quivered in disgust. Xandra and Alexa came up next to her covered in Nicole's blood, and they too stared down at the man that took them from their home and left them in the hands of a trafficker for money. Help me, my daughters, K. 
Kellen muttered out the best he could. Go to hell, they both said and turned away from him. Kellen watched as the only children he even remotely loved turned their back on him without even a second glance. As my sisters said, go to hell, Saren repeated and had the root of a tree impale him from underneath. Saren watched as the life from his eyes slowly died away, and when she heard the final beat of his heart, she finally let out the breath that she had been holding for the last decade. But the reverence of peace that she felt was pierced through as the cries of Jason, Keaton, and Kendrick could be heard. At some point during the chaos, Kendrick and the others were turned back to normal. That's when Saren noticed several unknown men and women speaking with Svetlana. She would have to deal with that later, first, her pack needed her. Dylan, you old fool. Why would you do that? Ronan shouted. Grace needs you, Dylan whispered. Dylan had been the one that had taken the syringe full of poison in his back. He saved Ronan, his best friend. Felix was standing over him as well. Milan. Come on, baby, stay with me. Jason cried. What happened to her? Saren asked as she kneeled down between both her and Dylan. Tessa must have cut her with a blade or something. It was probably laced with the poison, Jason explained while holding onto a feverish Milan, who was going in and out of consciousness. She came over to check on Dylan and suddenly collapsed. That's when I saw the cut on her arm. Saren didn't know what to say. Saren, save them. Kendrick cried while holding his father. I can't, Saren replied. Yes, you can. You have the power to stop people from dying. No, you don't get it. I can't save them both. I can only save one. Saren cried. Milan. You have to save Milan. Our kids need her. Jason cried. We need our father. We've already lost our mom to poison. Keaton cried. Saren was at a crossroads. She needed to decide who to save, and she had to decide soon before they both died. Milan. Everyone snapped their heads up. Save Milan, Jasper said. Jasper. Kendrick shouted and got to his feet, shoving Jasper back. This is my dad. The man who's been like an uncle to you. He saved your father's life. I get that, Ken, I really do, but Jason's point is more valid. Their pups need their mother. Jasper said with tears in his eyes. This was the choice that he had to make. The choice that Cellini warned him about. Not a choice about who he killed or didn't kill, but an impossible choice between choosing a man, who has been like a second father to him, or the friend that he's loved like a sister all of his life. Kendrick. He looked down at his father, who signaled for him to come closer. Dad? Just hang on. Maybe Saren can save you both. No. Dad. Keaton cried. Irene was sobbing next to him, and Melody was also crying with Ronan and Grace holding her. I'm ready to be with your mother, Dylan whispered. Dad. Come on. You have to meet your grandpup. You promised me. Keaton wept. I'm sorry. Kia. Kia. Keaton, Dylan croaked and spit up blood. Milan. Luna, save. Milan. Saren didn't have the luxury of second guessing and immediately turned her back on Dylan. She bit into Milan's neck, opposite of Jason's mark, and injected her venom, praying that it would be enough to counteract the poison. As Saren worked to save Milan's life, she concentrated on Dylan's slow heartbeat. She could feel his wolf trying to fight off the poison, but it was turning into a losing battle as it soon took the soul of his wolf, and all that was left was the body of a human. Dylan's heartbeat became more steady, with seconds passing per beat. 
As his heart rate came to a palpable stop, Milan started to accelerate. That's how Saren knew that her venom was running its course and pushing out the poison from Milan's body. Saren pulled back and watched as the poison seeped out of the wound and evaporated into thin air. As the last of the poison disintegrated, Dylan took his last breath. Dad! Kendrick called out. Dad! Keaton cried. Dad, both bald and buried their faces into Dylan's still see. Hest. Saren bowed her head and cried, while everyone else did as well. Even those who were not part of Blue Lake cried and paid their respects for the loss of the former Beta. Kendrick stood to his feet in pure rage and punched Jasper square across the jaw. Jasper slowly faced his best friend with tears streaming down his own cheeks. Both just stared at each other crying and then H. Ugged each other to give one another comfort. One comforting his best friend and Beta for the loss of his father. The man who raised him and his younger brother to be the men that they are today. And the other comforting his best friend and Alpha, who had to make an impossible choice. Chapter 78, The End Saren's POV Time stood still as I listened to Dylan take his last breath, hot tears blurring my vision and weighing down my head as I wept. Seeing him lying lifeless on the ground seemed like a bad dream. It was a grim reminder that being the most powerful werewolf to ever exist didn't mean I could save everyone or exclude me from heartache, as my life has taught me time and again. Hoping that the Pattersons and Morgan would be the only casualties tonight was foolish on my part. What I still couldn't wrap my head around was that I didn't see Dylan die in my premonition. I didn't get one of him at all. It was how I knew that I was never meant to save him. Dylan was supposed to die tonight, as horrible. As that may sound. It didn't mean that it hurt any less. Dylan sacrificed himself to save Ronan. Kendrick, Keaton, I'm so sorry, I whispered to them as I stood up. Keaton didn't even spare me a glance, but Kendrick broke away from Jasper and H. Ugged me while sobbing into my hair. I wish I could have saved them both. I am so sorry, Ken, I broke down again. It's not your fault. I know you would have if you could. He pulled away, and I couldn't help but shed more tears when I saw the pain in his eyes of losing his father. It was grief that I understood all too well. Melody was right there waiting for him, and they tearfully embraced each other. Saren. I looked behind me and saw Svetlana approaching with the group of unknown men and women. She conjured up some clothes for Jasper and me, and we walked over to meet her. Thanks for the clothes, I said and wiped my tears. Of course. It is nothing. Saren, Jasper, I want to introduce you to the Coven Mothers of Dark Witches and Coven Fathers of Dark Wizards she announced as she directed our attention to the group behind her. Why are they here? Jasper asked curiously. Good evening, my name is Sonia. I am Morgan's coven mother, and I sincerely apologize for her actions. Svetlana informed us of what Morgan had done. Morgan was a young dark witch and was misguided regarding the terms of owing a debt. What is more, she was manipulated by Kale Thornwood. Is that supposed to make us feel bad for her? I scoffed, a little annoyed. No, of course not. What Morgan did to you and the others is unforgivable. It was why I reached out to the other covens of dark witches and wizards. Because Morgan died before the shrinking spell was reversed on your friends and the others, we had to work together to create enough power to counteract it. Sonia replied. Even though we are dark supernatural, like you werewolves, we live by a code. Just as light witches, we cannot use magic for personal vendettas. Our Wiccan goddess forbids it. It's the one absolute law we all share as users of dark craft, one of the dark wizards added. And you are? Jasper asked. Oh, where are my manners? My name is Judas. Judas, 
Sonia, thank you for reversing the spell on the hostages, I said genuinely. Think nothing of it. The last thing we need is for the dark Wiccan goddess to come and punish us for allowing Morgan to get away with her misdeeds, Sonia replied. So, there is a separate goddess for dark witches and wizards? Jasper asked. Yes. Miranda is the goddess of light craft, and then there's Melinda, the goddess of dark craft. Jasper and I just nodded at the information. We're sorry that we couldn't be of more help, Sonia added as she looked in the direction of Dylan. We both gave her a curt smile, and they all took their leave. Well, that answers that, Jasper concluded. I nodded my head and looked up at him. Hey, Jasper. Yeah. How did you get here so fast? Hey? Oh, um, well, truth be told, I'm not exactly sure. At first, Blade was going his normal werewolf speed. But the next thing I knew, we were getting faster and faster. It was crazy because it took the phrase out of body experience to the next level. I seriously felt like we were almost flying. Blade mentioned that we must have picked up on your energy. Really? Yeah. He said it may have happened because I finally unconditionally accepted you for who you are. I guess that's what the ancient texts meant when they said that we would be powerful together. Why didn't you tell me the truth in the beginning when I first asked you if you were okay with me being a primordial? At first, I was perfectly fine with it. I was excited to have a powerful mate. I thought I knew what to expect, but when I started to realize just how powerful you were going to be, I couldn't help but feel a pang of jealousy. I mean, I'm a pure-blooded alpha too, but my mom didn't come from alpha blood. So, in a way, I kind of felt like I was given the short end of the stick while you were given the big end. And as an alpha male, that kind of hurt my pride in ways I never anticipated. I know that I shouldn't have let it affect me that way, but deep down, it stung a bit. I didn't know how to process it, and I never learned how to sit in that discomfort. Mom thinks that's why I was susceptible to Layla's bullsh, T. I didn't know how to reply to that. In a way, it made sense because the male ego is pretty big. Well, I mean, not much we can do about it now, I finally told him. Every pack in the region just watched me impale Kellen with the root of a tree. Yeah, I looked up at him, and he looked down at me. We both chuckled at the same time. So, what was it like being a real-life Tinkerbell? I scowled at him and punched him in the gut. Oof. That's not funny. It was horrible. I never want to be that small ever again. Guys. We turned around to see Griffin and the others. I looked at Xandra and Alexa and smiled. I opened my arms, and they came and H.Ugged me. Thanks for coming to my rescue. I will be forever grateful to have you two in my life, I told them. They H.Ugged me tighter, and I just felt their smiles glowing. So, what happens now? Xandra asked as they pulled away. Well, first we have to dispose of the TRKL Thornwood, and then we will have to plan a service for Dylan. He's the former Beta, and he died protecting Ronan, the former Alpha, I answered. Dylan will be buried with the highest honor a werewolf can be given. Even though those honors are typically for alphas who pass, Dylan sacrificed himself to save an alpha. It's the least we can do, Richard announced. Thank you, Richard. That would mean a lot to Kendrick and Keaton, Jasper replied and shook Richard's hand. So, I guess this means you guys can finally have your ceremonies to pass on the tea. TLE. And Richard can finally become an elder, I subtly mentioned. As they all smiled and nodded their heads, I spotted Riker with an unknown female. A very pretty female, to be exact. Riker, 
who do you have there with you? I coyly asked. Riker didn't miss the tone in my voice and grinned at me. I'd like for everyone to meet my mate, Rain, Riker introduced. She's obviously a were tiger. We all said our introductions, and Rain was very excited to meet everyone. It turned out that Rain was on the run from tiger poachers. She just so happened to run through the Golden Moon Pack territory not long after Griffin and the others set out to join Jasper in rescuing the hostages. While running through the pack lands, she literally collided with Riker, who was doing patrols around Golden Moon to keep an eye out for Kellen in case he happened to show up. The rest, they say, is history. Please let us know when the memorial service will be held. I'm assuming it will take a while to plan, Griffin said to us. Of course, Jasper replied. Richard, please keep us in the loop about the honors for Dylan. I will. With that, Griffin and the Golden Moon Pack left and went home. One by one, the other Alphas and their pack members came over and paid their respects to us as well as Kendrick and Keaton. About an hour later, the only people left were the pack members of Blue Lake. Victor and the others got to work cleaning up the body parts and disposing of them by lighting them on fire. They offered to do the cleanup because they wanted closure and were finally able to put an end to their chapters with the Pattersons. Jasper instructed Owen and Angelo to return to the Blood Moon territory to find Kale Thornwood and Morgan's bodies and dispose of them as well. Ronan, Felix, Kendrick, and Keaton worked together to lift Dylan's body and took him to the pack hospital, where Dr. Andrews would clean him up and prepare him for his burial. Watching them take him away had me in tears again, but I knew that he was in a better place now and that he was happy to finally be with Lizzie again. Grace, Zoe, Melody, and Irene went with them. Jason carried Milan to the pack hospital as well since she was still unconscious. Come on, let's go inside, Jasper said as he interlocked our fingers. UMM, you go on ahead. There's something that I need to do first. Is everything okay? Yeah, everything's fine. There's just something I need to do. One final thing to put to rest. Do you need me to go with you, he asked, visibly worried. No. This is something that I have to do on my own. It's the only way that I will officially be able to let go of everything. Jasper stared at me hesitantly but eventually nodded when he saw that I was adamant about doing this alone. Okay. Be careful, baby. I love you. I love you too, Jasper. He gave me a quick kiss and went inside along with everyone else. When I was finally alone, I-S-T-R, P-P-E-D myself of the clothes Svetlana had conjured and shifted into Kelly. She picked up the clothes in her mouth, and we went on our way. It didn't take long to arrive at our destination, and when we made it to the start of my final journey, Kelly gave me control, and I shifted back. I got dressed and took the first step forward. I walked as slow as a snail while I took everything in. As I did, Little by little, tears threatened to fall, but I kept them from doing so. That is until I made it to the wreckage of what used to be the Silver Lake Pack House. Now that Morgan was dead, the mirage of a gaping hole the others had mentioned was gone, and all that remained was debris amongst the land of my birthplace. I stepped over broken glass, bricks, and wood that had long ago begun to decay with weeds growing around them. I finally found the spot I was searching for the hiding place where my mother had put me in to keep me safe. The place where Kellen first found me and where my entire life had changed. As I stood there and images of that horrible night flooded my mind, I buried my face in my hands, fell to my knees, and allowed myself to grieve. I burst into tears and let it all out. I cried the tears I was never able to release bawling until I became a whimpering mess. I don't even know how long I had cried for. It must have been a while because, by the time I was done, my legs were asleep, 
and I couldn't breathe from the amount of snot dripping from my nose. It was a long time coming, but I was finally able to release the pain. I stood up and let out one final breath of contentment before walking away. But I wasn't ready to go just yet. There was one more thing that I needed to do. I walked away from the pack house ruins and traveled to the one place on the land that I swore to return to once I avenged my parents. I stood over this sacred place and knew deep in my heart that this was where they were. I took a deep breath, closed my eyes, and slowly started to lift my hands. I knew when I had them. I opened my eyes and stared at the ground, not wanting to face reality, but I knew that I had to. I raised my head slowly, and tears automatically fell when I saw my parents' remains in front of me. I kept them levitated in the air and walked them over towards the back of the pack territory where our lake used to be. I made it to the embankment, even though there was no water left. I kept my parents' remains levitated with one hand while I dug fresh new graves with the other. When the hole was deep enough, I gently placed them in and covered them with as much love and adoration as I could. When I was finished, I got down on my knees and cried with a sense of relief now that I could give my parents a proper burial. And at the very spot that my mom told my dad that she was pregnant with me. It was truly a cathartic moment. As I kneeled next to them, finally able to put their souls to rest, I sensed someone behind me. I lifted my head and looked behind me, but no one was there. I stood up and turned around, keeping my guard up. No one was supposed to be here. It didn't smell like a rogue. It didn't smell like anything at all. As I stood there frozen, I could feel something warm next to me. Actually, something warm on both sides of me. The next thing I knew, a warmth unlike anything I've felt before, consumed my entire being. It was like I was being aged ugged by fire, but it wasn't burning me. It was comforting and felt like love. As fast as the warmth came, it was gone, and I knew exactly what it was. I lost all sense of self-control and began sobbing. I never thought I would ever feel the warmth of my parents' embrace again, but somehow, some way, they were both able to age. UG me and tell me that they were near. I turned back around to face their final resting place. I love you, too. Don't worry about me. I'm going to be okay now. Everything is going to be okay from now on. One year later. Jasper's POV. Right there. A little more to the right. Little more. No, Jasper, that's too far. Saren screamed at me. It's been a year since that fateful night where everything in our lives finally came full circle. A week after that night, we buried Dylan with the highest honors bestowed to a werewolf, as promised by Richard, and we were able to send him off to be with Aunt Lizzie. Kendrick and Keaton had to see a therapist to deal with the loss, but it didn't take them long to recuperate. Milan, unfortunately, didn't recover as fast emotionally, that is. After she woke up from the effects of the poison, Jason explained everything that had happened, and she ended up with a severe case of survivor's guilt. Even though Ken and Keaton held no qualms against her, she held them against herself, and it ate her alive for several months. She's gotten better since and it helped that her twins were now running around driving her insane, so she had something else to focus on. It also helped that they're running in their wolf forms, allowing Ivory to take over and bond with them as well. Shifting has been good for Milan. My parents went on a six-month-long vacation for just the two of them, along with Felix and Zoe doing their own thing as well. Losing Dylan and having both suffered near-death experiences, my parents decided that they wanted to concentrate on themselves and officially enjoy retirement. No kids or grandkids. Though, their timing had kind of s ducked because they missed the birth of our daughter Aurora. Who just happens to be the spitting image of Saren, 
only she has my teal eyes. Thankfully, Sam was more accepting of Aurora after she was born, and he actually tries to play with her, even though she's only seven months old. After Saren came home that night, she told me where she had gone and what she had done. I was happy that she was finally able to close that chapter of her life and continue moving forward. That didn't deter me from keeping my promise to build memorials for Mitch and Megan, though, which is what we're doing right now. The only problem was that Saren refuses to use humans to handle the labor. So, here I was, using a crane to lower down the statues of Mitch and Megan we commissioned. She would use her powers to help me, but she currently had her hands full with Aurora, who kept trying to jump into the lake. Yes, we had the lake refilled and brought back to its former glory. Jasper. Saren screamed again. I told you we needed to use the guys at the company. Jasper, get out and let me do it. Griffin shouted at me. You know how to use these. My dad worked as a construction worker with humans before my sister was born. He taught me how to use these things when I was 16. Now get out. I raised my hands in defeat, put the machine in park, and let Griffin have the wheel. Just as he claimed, he knew how to use it, and he was able to get the statues in place in one go. Thank you, Griffin. At least someone knows how to operate heavy machinery. Saren took a jab at me. Hey. Just because I run an architecture company does not mean I know how to use the machinery. I have employees and contractors for a reason, I defended. Aurora, no. Saren shouted when she caught her trying to crawl into the lake again. She used powers to bring her to us and landed her in my arms. Princess, are you trying to give mommy a heart attack? I asked and kissed her chubby cheeks. Daddy, look. Sam shouted as he showed me a cool looking rock he found by the bank of the lake. Sam was better at listening since he knew making Saren mad would only end with him getting no dessert at dinner and the most boring bath time with no water show. We've kept a very close relationship with Golden Moon, given that the Luna and Beta female are family. Alexa and Brent have their hands full with their own set of identical twins on the way and Xandra and Griffin have their hands full with an ever-growing Killian who is now over three years old and starting to cause mayhem wherever he goes. He and Sam are two peas in a pod. It also helps that Killian just happens to be Aurora's mate. I was a little disturbed at first because, legally, Killian is Aurora's cousin, but I was reminded by Saren, Xandra and Griffin that they have no blood relation whatsoever. I guess this was Selene's and William's way of reconciling with each other and with the girls. Finally. Their memorials are done. Saren squealed with delight, looking up at the life-size statues of Mitch and Megan. Mom was so pretty, Xandra said and leaned her head on Saren's shoulder. Yeah, she was. That's why we're pretty too. Alexa boasted as she rubbed her swelling stomach. I really hope those babies in there don't turn out as crazy and outspoken like you, Alexa. Otherwise, we're going to be in trouble, Saren commented. Do you guys know what you're having? I asked Brent. Nope. Well, I don't, at least. Xandra won't tell me. What do you mean Xandra won't? Oh. She went to the future to see didn't she? I asked, and Brent nodded. What? Xandra exclaimed and stuck her tongue at me. So, now that the memorials are done, when are we going to start on the pack house? Griffin asked, coming up to me. Hold on, why are you guys so excited for the pack house? This is going to be a vacation home for my family and me. I griped. We are family. They all yelled in unison. Okay, geez. I said and waved the white flag in surrender, making everyone laugh. 
Aurora giggled with delight in my arms while Sam and Killian ran around as little boys do. Saren came up next to me, and I put my arm around her shoulder and kissed her forehead. Things between us have never been this good, and I knew that it would only get better from here. I looked over at Zandra and nodded my head at her. She took Aurora from me, and I turned to face Saren. Without saying a word, I got down on one knee, making her gasp. Jasper, what are you? Saren Calloway, will you marry me? The End Join our Facebook and WhatsApp group for more updates, link is given in description, rest audiobook will be continued in next episode.